Okay, we're looking at uh, chapter 1 of Zechariah, and verses 1, verse 7 through 21. And it reads, uh, we have the verses written here for you as well as uh, explanation. It says, On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month Shebat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edu, saying, so we know that the 11th month is January, February. In fact, it's about this time of year that this was happening, that he received. And of course, it's 11th month, even though it's the beginning of our year, because that was the lunar calendar, whereas ours is a solar calendar. Um, uh, in the second year of Darius, uh, Darius was, had inherited the actions of previous kings. And you know what the law of the Medes and Persians are. You know, you know what, it, what it means. It cannot be changed. And the big issue is, can you find it? <laughs> because there's so many laws that were passed, because they didn't need a legislature. And the, the king just said, this is a law. He used the embodiment of their gods, and therefore... Whatever he said went. There's an absolute authority. Do you remember the um, um, idol, the huge idol that Nebuchadnezzar built? Uh, what was the head? Made of what material? Gold. A very hard metal. The shoulders were silver. That was the Medo-Persians. This is Babylon. Babylon was the head of gold. This is the Medo-Persians. The thighs in Daniel chapter 2 were made of bronze, which was the future kingdom of the Greece, Greece and that an expansion of Alexander the Great into Egypt and as far as India, or east as India. And, and then the, the last part was iron mixed with clay, which is the Roman. Um, so what that's indicating is that the power was, was greater, the far-reaching power of these kings, these emperors, was much greater and deteriorated to got down to the bottom. Now it was iron for the Romans, but the iron mixed with clay may have been subsequent empires of the world. So it may not have been true that Rome was so easy to get along with. In fact, um, there were some things about, as we'll see here, the decree, the law of the Medes and Persians doesn't change. Cyrus made a decree as recorded in the book of Ezra in chapter one. Remember how um, Ezra came to him broken. And he's learning of what needed to be done to the to the house of Israel. And Jehovah spoke to an ancient king recorded in all the history books. Cyrus he spoke to him. And, and Cyrus turned around and, and spoke this decree and made it into law. That's important to remember here because um, the whole idea of God coming to his people and saying, return unto me and how he had so much control. He could have taken over this world, but he, he allows us to make a choice. He gives us a choice whether we want to follow him or not. Uh, and so um, it says that also Artaxerxes upheld and, and resupplied this effort through Nehemiah's word. Nehemiah came to him saying, things are not going well. And so Artaxerxes said, and it is, I think it is affection towards Nehemiah. Nehemiah had a, an important role to play. It wasn't to go. It's almost like um, sending missionaries. We may not be the one called to go, but we may be the one who supplies the need. And that's what Nehemiah did. Um, so now, in this time, of course, after this... Um, Darius is called upon to find this decree that Cyrus made. In the second year, he did. 
That's what it tells us here. Um, and then Zechariah is the conveyor of God's word in uh, verse 7. Uh, he, the word comes to him. And in, in Ezra 6.14 is where it mentions that the elder of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet of, and Zechariah, the son of Idu. So we see the connection between Haggai and Zechariah. Uh, you notice in this case, his father skipped. Um, his father actually doesn't have uh, the, he's probably not living at the time. Idu is also mentioned, his grandfather was mentioned as the present leadership of the priests of the tribe of Levi in chapters 12, chapter 12 of Nehemiah, verses 1 through 7. And Zechariah was connected to him in the lineage in verse 16. So this is the way they're, they're all connected. Um, Darius is just a consolidator. That's basically his role. He's try, he's supposed to try to keep everything that these previous kings had, and basically it becomes a straitjacket. It's one of the reasons why Medo-Persia was defeated by the Greeks, because they could not escape how things were done before. And other kings prior to them would not allow for any innovation or change. Um, but the word of the Lord still worked through them. So in verse 8, it says, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. And he was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen. And behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. Now, the man riding a red horse in verse 12 was referred to as the angel of the Lord. So you, you can put together, perhaps, uh, we don't... We can't be dogmatic about this, but we can see he's a, he's a man, and then he's an angel of the Lord. Could this be the pre-incarnate Christ? Possibly. I don't know that we can be dogmatic about it. There was an angel of the Lord that appeared many times through the book of Judges, one to Gideon. Um, there's also angels of the Lord that appear to um, Joseph, the mother of the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So we have the uh, possibility, uh, but it seems to ring true. We'll see it later on. Uh, myrtle trees were not much greater than the size of a bush. They may have stood about this high. Uh, but they did have, they were, they were a broadleaf type of, of plant, which was rare in this part of the world. They were used uh, to build the makeshift tabernacles when they had the Feast of the Tabernacles, the unleavened bread. Uh, they would make little booths. What would that represent, by the way? Temporary shelter? Yes, when they, when they had to, when they were wandering in the wilderness and they had to make temporary shelter. So this was, this was commemorating uh, in that feast of what they did then. Uh, but they used, often used myrtle, tr myrtle tree branches and the leaves to build these little booths. Um, they were one of the few broadleaf plants, and they were used to build booths and a piece of tabernacles. And he's riding, and then it says he's standing. So I, I think perhaps this means he's on the horse standing still. But behind him are following other horses. Now, it doesn't say anything about other riders, but it mentions that they went throughout the earth, back and forth patrolling. So uh, perhaps there's other angels or men on these horses. We don't know. It doesn't say. Um, it, they're also in the glen. It's a river bed, bed that would be very deep. Um, when I was younger, my parents used to go out to see cousins in northwest Iowa. And there would be um, flatland, 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 flatland. And um, I didn't know it at the time, but they had these um, flatlands tiled so they would drain off. And they did this very meticulously because they had to. In other words, if, when it rained, it would be nothing but a mud everywhere. 
so they had to drain off these places. And then the, the streams around the area began to erode. So I had the idea that I, at that time in my life, I'd like to go fishing. My father was not a fisherman. And so I asked the, my cousin, a couple, couple of degrees removed, older man, um, to take me fishing. So he took me out to what he called a stream. And I, I got to the edge of it, looked down. It must have been about 30 feet. Um, I didn't know how you know, fish in a place like that. If I caught something, it may get off my line before I got it up. Um, and he couldn't get down there. There was no place I could see to get down. Uh, but apparently there was other things that could have been done I didn't know at the time. So this is what we're talking about as a, as a glen. It is a deep ditch. And so you can imagine Zechariah and the angel with him that's speaking is actually um, um, looking down in this ditch. They're, and they're seeing a man on a horse, a red horse. And um, behind him are white, sorrel, and red horses. Now the, the color of the horse um, he was riding a horse colored in red. Actually, it is red as blood. It's the Hebrew word Adam, which actually means it's the word Adam. Did you know Adam's nickname? Red. It means from the earth. He was formed from the earth. Or actually, his, he was breathed, God breathed upon him and made him into a man out of the, out of the earth of the dirt of the ground. So the dirt was apparently like a red-brown color. And from that, uh, if you live in Ephrata, you would say red. If you live anywhere else, you'd say brown. So whether this horse, uh, actually the, the word means as red as blood. And most bl blood would be red. If you had my blood, it'd be a darker red. If you had my wife's blood, it'd be a bright red. Uh, but um, in, in, that, in that range of color, is this horse. And there's another place in scripture that speaks of a red horse. And it speaks of the person who's riding the red horse. It's an angel in that case as well. It says in Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. And out of another horse, bright red. And its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that the people should slay one another and he was given a great sword. Remember we said about how the highlights of prophecy focus on the two comings of Christ, his first and his second. And there are two mountaintops and what we see is in between. Actually the description of what he's saying here in the book of Revelation which is definitely a reference to the end times and the second coming of Christ. He's also saying about what's happening in this prophecy, which is happening in the current time. So not all these visions are going to be relating to something future. Most of them are going to be relating to something present. And there's something going on behind the scene. This, this is true of spiritual warfare. It's happening behind the scenes. Everything else seems to be normal. Peaceful, tranquil, boring. <laughs> but there's some really amazing things going on behind the scenes we don't know anything about. But that's imp important that we become a, a, we acquire some information about what's going on so we can be alerted to it. Verse 9 says, Then I said, What are these, my Lord? So uh, Zechariah is speaking in the first person. And he's asking, what are these, my Lord? He's, why does he say, my Lord? These are angels. I think there's a distinction there where he's indicating, and I failed to capitalize the Lord, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the, I think he's saying that um, he respects this particular angel on the red horse. I don't know if he's yelling down him in the glen. What are these? What does this mean? So he's actually indicating, um, as he's being shown this scene, 
that it had a greater implied meaning. Um, so he knows something's going on here. It's not fully revealed what, what's going on um, at that point, but he, he anticipates there's more to be understood. Uh, there's the angel accompanying him that was designated as an angel and not an angel of the Lord. So there's also a distinction between angels as there is among demons. Um, when Satan approached Jesus, he seemed very confident that he had control of the world. But when Jesus approaches Legion in Mark chapter 5, he says, please don't come to tor torment me. Send me in those, in a, into those swine, <laughs> which is remarkable. He's, he's very trembling and fearful. It says in James chapter 1, that even the angels, know, even the demons know this and they fear and tremble. Uh, but there's a difference between angels, there's a difference between uh, those who are um, demons. Uh, there are two classes of angels. The seraphim are messenger angels, whereas the cherubim are angels that were to protect the holiness of God. A cherub that derives its meaning from the Hebrew term sword is karab. It's like, it makes the sound of like a sword being taken from its sheath. Uh, there was a lot of words like that in Hebrew. Um, for instance, the, when you're shearing sheep, the, sh the word shear goes zzz. So it, it's sort of like the sound of a scissors. Um, a cherub was posted at the uh, entrance of the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve was banished from it. So there again, the holy place of the Garden of Eden where it was supposed to be perfect innocence and perfect creation. Adam and Eve were banished from it, could never longer go into it, and it was guarded by a cherub. Um, Isaiah was commissioned as a prophet of Judah by placing a burning coal on his lips. Actually, the seraphim brought it to him. The seraphim, it was in his presence at the time. So they were indicating, were indicating seraphim messengers. So, uh, and it also it mentions in Hebrews chapter one that the, uh, ser the angels come to minister to those who are the heirs of salvation. So it seems like for human beings, a seraph is a bearer of good news, the good news of the gospel. But a cherub is being seemingly a bearer of bad news, of judgment for men. Verse 2 indicates a special, actually it's verse 3, I'm sorry, um, uh, indicates a special message for the exiles of Judah and Israel. Return unto me. It doesn't say return to Israel. It says return to me. Big mistake that many people make when they look at prophecy. They think that the gathering of the people, the Jews, back in Israel today, starting in 1948, is a fulfillment. Not necessarily, because they didn't return there for the Lord. Uh, I, I know that behind the scenes, he may be preparing for that. And I do believe what it says, and this is one of, the, one of the issues when it comes to the study of last things called eschatology, and what brings to churches and denominations to, sometimes to blows, but to division. And that is, what about Israel? Are we going to take, is God going to take up his dealings once again with Israel? And we remember that one prophecy in the book of Zechariah, where it says that he was, they, when they look upon him whom they have pierced, and we see that as a fulfillment of what happened as, as it's recorded in the Gospels when Jesus was on the cross. It says that the nation shall be born in a day. So could it be that when this age is finished and we come to the second coming of Christ, 
somewhere before or after. Many, I'm not saying all. And also in the book of Revelation, it talks about chapter 7, how that there's 144,000 from the 12 different tribes of Judah that are protected with a seal against uh, the um, murderous intent of the Antichrist and the beast. Um, so I believe that there's some evidence in Scripture that Israel's not a picture. Now, what, what others may say, more of the persuasion of covenant theology, is that um, the church was in Israel, and now the Israel is in the church. And so that's the other, other side of this thing. Do I want to be dogmatic about either one? No. I will stick to what scriptures say, but I'm not going to come down side on saying that this person is a heretic because they believe this or that, because these are things that we do not really know for sure. Um, so I don't know how you learned it. I know I'm probably bringing up subjects that you may not have heard about before, uh, but this has probably been uh, a big thing that's changed in the more recent time. Um, it was one time many of our evangelical schools were leaning towards um, dispensationalism, which is saying that there's going to be a, an ingathering of Israel and salvation brought to many in that nation and be reborn in the kingdom of God, the millennial kingdom. Um, and the issue of the tribulation is another dividing factor. Whereas in the church age, many believe this is just a part of our own trials and tribulation. They get increasingly worse at times come in as the second coming approaches. There are, there are others who say, no, this, there is a distinct seven year period which we pointed out in, from the book of Daniel, chapter nine, verse 24 to 20, 20 through 27. So I don't wanna get into that subject too much, but I just wanted you to make, be aware of it. But the issue is, we are to return, they are to return to him. Um, and as this thing becomes more encouraging in the book of Zechariah, the truth is that it, these were fulfilled, not in the nation, but in actually in Jesus Christ. That's why in this church age, we are referred to as being in Christ. Because we don't have, like Israel, a, a sort of an invested uh, place like the temple. And this is where people see the presence of God. Or where we can sort of take it and call it our own. Uh, and, and, the, and God can be somewhere off in the distance from us. And we can say, we're, we're, we're his. You have to come to us. Uh, instead, it's a matter of, it's all in Jesus. It's not a matter of anything we can do to, pr to, to promote anything of God's will in this world without being in Him. So, so he says in um, uh, the angel Lord um, may be a connotation of the pre-incarnate Christ who is the man and the Lord, the Father, said to my Lord in um, Hebrews 1.5, to which of the angels did God say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And then and that's also quoted from Psalm 2.5. And then in Psalm 104.4, quoted in Psalm, actually that's Hebrews, I think, 2.7. 2, yeah. Of the angels, he said, 1.7, of the angels, he says, he uh, makes his angels winds and ministers of flames of fire. So we're still in this issue of um, not being sure if Jesus is in his pre-incarnate position as the angel of the Lord or not. Um, but there's seem seemingly a lot of support for the possibility. It may not be so important after all, but it's at least an interesting part. In verse 10, so the man who was standing by the among the myrtle trees, answered, these are they whom the Lord sent to patrol the earth. 
So what are they doing? What are they looking for? Will be your guess based on the context. They're looking for somebody. They're looking for some people to do what? Pardon? Stand in the gap. Right. They're looking for people to, 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 to he, the, not all of Israel has yet moved forward. And there's many people, many people of Israel who had grown content where they were. Throughout the Middle East, they still have um, ancestries. I mean, you know, you've ever been a part of Ancestry.com. Did you ever do that? You took the hair and at the base of your scalp and sent it into them. Um, they were able to. Tr they're able to trace all the way back to the Middle East anybody's heritage. And mine all seemed to be nestled in Switzerland through Germany through, and Sally's on the other hand, has a string, a little tiny string that comes from the Middle East into Italy and then up through the same area. So there are, there were Jews of course, throughout um, the Middle East and quite often they, they were not forbidden, they were forbidden to actually be a part of any other Europeans life and family as well as in the Jewish community you weren't allowed to be a part of that if you were not Jewish so it would never be known you know if you had someone in your heritage unless you do something with your genes so th there's certainly a, and they've also found through these studies that there are 12 distinct people groups within those who have a heritage that's Jewish that's what I was trying to point out uh, so the man who was standing among the myrtle trees says they're patrolling the earth. The man standing there uh, answered Zechariah's question himself concerning what was the meaning of this man and the horses in the glen. There is no other riders on the horses following this man that are riding the red horse in the lead. And when they say they're behind him, they're actually following him. And the Lord was sent has sent them uh, to size up the level of restlessness of the people on the earth. And about their pre the presence of Yahweh had been among the people with some excitement and even turmoil over this huge neglect. Um, we'll see that um, when they come back in verse 11, we'll actually read it, they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, we have patrolled the earth, and behold, the earth remains at rest. Um, now, without knowing any of the context, you might say, well, that's good. No, no one's upset. No one, everything's at peace. Everyone's fine. No one's getting rousted. But these particular patrollers on the earth are not so happy about this. The man in verse 8 is now the angel of the Lord of hosts. Instead of just being a man, he's considered to be the angel of the Lord of hosts. That was standing among the myrtle trees as he was as the man. They say some apparent consternation. We have patrolled the earth and behold, the earth remains at rest. Outside this context, it is not apparent that they should be upset that the earth is at peace. The word uh, for rest indicates undisturbed. So I guess they'd rather have us a little disturbed. For the Jews to be undisturbed would be, would be indicating a hardening of their hearts. Not having a concern about, that should be God's presence, God's absence. For the Gentiles, it would, be, it would indicate that they are unaffected, unimpacted by how Jehovah had subtly subdued the kingdoms and overthrew the high and holy dictator without as much as pulling a string on one bow or a, th or a thrust or one spear or a swing of one single sword. You can see how, how this happens. We'll, we'll see this much later on in the next vision. Uh, but um, God had orchestrated behind the scenes 
great huge kingdoms to fall. And in the history books, it reads how the Media Persians overtook the Babylonians. The Babylonians didn't last too long. I mean, so shortly after they invaded Judah and took the people of Judah captive, they didn't even last more than 30, 40 years of that. Do you know how the city was overtaken? This is a city, huge. Two chariots, four horses pulling each chariot, in two different directions could pass each other on top of the wall. And there'd be plenty of room to spare. They could immobilize their forces quickly. And they basically wooed themselves to sleep. They, they assumed that they were impregnable. There was a Euphrates River that flowed through the city. And it was deep at that point. Um, and all the Medo-Persians did, as their engineers, took the river out around a different direction and walked in on dry land when these people were sleeping. <laughs> so they didn't really have to do much at all to overtake Babylon. This is the great Babylon. As the same kind of verbiage it's used in Revelation 18. How they had acquired gods and they acquired goods and they had so many good things about them and he says Babylon the Great has fallen. And the harlot, the woman, is the, is the presider over this. It's actually considered to be the false church. Um, and so um, they totally missed what was happening in the spiritual realm to stand and stand to continue to, blind, to be blind to it. Um, and then um, the angel of the Lord in verse 12 says, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem, on the cities of Judah, against which you have been angry these 70 years? So this same angel of the Lord, if we would assume that this was the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, he would be complaining to the Lord of hosts, the one who brought this revelation, brought this vision, to Zechariah. How long have you had no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah? Why? Everything's at peace, resting, undisturbed. So wh why do you want anything to happen? He said, you've been angry these 70 years. About what? Initially it was Judah turning to idols, turning away from God, turning to idols. But then it became these invaders, these who had taken them captive successively. So the angel of the Lord sizing up the, the whole up the whole earth, being at rest, is ex expresses his dissatisfaction that the whole earth is being at rest and is expressing that, number one, God is not having mercy yet on the cities of Judah and Jerusalem. And number two, God is still angry with his people. So, a few returned. But we see that they also come to some reckoning. Again, it's not just the, the place of the temple and by the way, um, why was the temple so important? Remember when um, Solomon built the, the temple. They took it from the, the tent, the tabernacle, made it into a permanent house in the Temple Mount. Yeah, what happened to, to indicate that? Uh, yeah. Eventually yeah, but I mean, what happened at the, the day it was dedicated? 
how was it indicated? What they call Shekinah glory? The smoke. So remember when they were in the wilderness? How were they led? This is very interesting. Yeah, fire by night and a, and a cloud by day. Is it that, was that the way it was? I think it was. And, and then actually in the morning, they would see the, the cloud come out of the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. Go out and sit on a hill, wait for them to get ready, and they would take them wherever they were going. They wandered 40 years that way. And they had not seen this happen. They had not seen the Shekinah glory. They, they heard about it, but they never saw it after they got into the land of Canaan. The tabernacle was there. The Ark of the Covenant inside the holiest places where only the high priest is permitted. In the holy place, the priests were permitted. Not all the Levites, just the, this, those priests that were assigned duty uh, where they had the table show bread, where they had the, the, the candlesticks. Um, and then outside of that, there were other priests up that took the sacrifice at the altar. But no, none of the other people were allowed to be there. And only the, the high priest could be in this holy place where the smoke resided on the Day of Atonement. Only time he was allowed in there. And so he represented the people. And the Shekinah glory suddenly reappears when they build this new temple in Saul. So this represented the presence of God with them. This is not so much the people returning to him, but God was in a position of re returning himself to them. And that actually never happened. We know that Zechariah, at the end of this life, as recorded in Matthew 23, uh, was killed between the altar and the holy place. I remember we thought that was sort of an inside job. We don't know, and they didn't know, apparently, at that time, where they would have said that no one knew who actually killed him. Um, so we see this is, this is bringing about a challenge that's not going to be fulfilled quickly. Verse 13 says, and the, and the Lord answered gracious and comforting words of the angel of the Lord who talked with me. Yahweh speaks to answer the concern of the angel of the Lord, speaking to him about them pleasantly and encouragingly. He used two words there to, to say, I'm not going to be scolding you. Instead, I'm going to be encouraging you. And I think there's only one way that's going to happen. And that is because he's going to take care of it through his son. Verse 14 says, So the angel who talked with me said to me, Cry out, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceeding jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. So he wanted these people who are undisturbed at peace and just sort of complacent. He wants them to cry out. He wants them to get excited about something. God is making an offer to us. We need to return. He's going to come back to us. He says, if you return to me, I'll return to you. And verse 15 says, And I am seeing the angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. In other words, I wanted Israel to be somewhat corrected. But what did they do? They took it away too far. And now he's angry with them. Israel never did regain independence. They always had to work with, in the shadows of a government. First the Greeks, and then the Romans, and then they were disbanded and throughout the world. Never to have a nation of their own until 1948. And then verse 16 says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I return to Jerusalem and with mercy. 
My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts. The measuring line shall be stretched over Jerusalem. Again, this is where the prophecy turns to that second coming rather than the first coming. In the first coming, it may have been a reference to how this is going to be fulfilled in Jesus himself personally. Because it's the Lord who builds the house. And uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. Remember that story? Ahaz is in trouble. He's one of, the, he's one of those wicked kings that come along in the midst of Hezekiah and Uzziah, which were fairly good kings in Judah. And the Assyrians had already started to impact and I think it was shortly thereafter they took Israel captive and away. So they were left sort of much, pretty much on their own. He, he was about to be invaded too. And he was out by a spring called Gihon. It was um, down in between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount. There was a spring there. He was trying to find ways to get that spring underground so that the, when they laid siege on the city of Jerusalem, they would not be able to um, cause them to have a lack of water. They'd have a, at least have a water source. So Isaiah comes out and says, ask the Lord for a sign. And I, if, I'll give you, he'll give you a sign to show you that you're going to be able to survive this. And what does Ahaz say to him? He says, I won't give, I won't ask for a sign. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother God with that. And he asked him several times, and he refused each time to actually do that, to take a sign from God that he survived. He was left to his own devices. He wanted to try it his own way. He didn't need God's help. He was being stubborn. Um, he didn't want to face his failure. He didn't want to have to depend on someone else to bail him out like God. And so there he was trying to do things on his own and Isaiah gets upset with him as he should. He said, okay, I'll give you a sign. If you want to take my sign yeah, from God, I'll give you a sign anyway. That a virgin shall bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And if you look at the remaining chapters of Isaiah from chapter 7 through 11. It talks about the government will be on his shoulders. So uh, it's not going to be through any king, any president of the United States. It's going to be through the, the king, Jesus, that we actually find the opportunity to have the Lord's presence among us. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that um, you might bless our time today and that we may learn from this in a way that honor you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.